Welcome back to Autism Live. If you watch this show at all, you know that I love whenever we can supercharge our kids' social skills, and you know that I love theater. And our next guest is going to talk about how we're putting those two things together to make amazing things possible and some research that they're doing to show how amazing it is. So we want to welcome to the show for the first time, but I hope not the last time, Dr. Matthew Lerner. He's joining us from, he's an assistant professor at Stony Brook, State University of New York at Stony Brook. So Dr. Lerner, I'm, I'm all a Twitter. I'm, I'm so excited uh, to have an opportunity to talk to you about this because it's two of the things that I love most we're talking about theater and we're talking about social skills. But before we talk about that, I want to talk specifically about you and your interest as a clinical psychologist in this whole idea of social skills and supercharging them because you've got a very special place in Stony Brook um, where you're working on these kinds of things. So first of all, welcome and tell us why this is your interest and what it is that you're doing in your place that they call the Learner Lab. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Anna. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and to have a chance to speak to you and, and uh, your audience about some of the stuff uh, that we've been doing around here. This is you know, near and dear to my heart and my, my life's work. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I've been interested in uh, some of this topic for uh, more than 20 years, actually, in, in uh, one form or another. Um, and uh, I, I kind of got into this, actually, um, originally, even before that, after uh, after college. Um, I had been uh, working, uh, sort of volunteering for a while with a young, young man at the time, uh, since he was two, actually, um, with autism. And uh, I graduated from college, actually, um, having studied philosophy and music, and of course, as a philosophy and music major, not having a lot of marketable skills to speak of, but I was interested in autism. I had worked with one, and so I started working in uh, social skills programs. Um, and I was really excited uh, to have the chance to do this, um, because uh, I was um, I wanted to sort of see what the experts did, what do the experts know. Um, and I remember working in my first uh, group with a group of, of teens on the spectrum and my job was to sit them in a room and tell them uh, rules for the summer. That was the, the main thrust of the approach that was being used. And what, what really struck me was that there were some kids who really grasped hold of this, loved this. They said, yeah, yeah, tell me more. I, I want to know. And then there were other kids who really didn't. Um, they would get kind of frustrated with me, they would say, you know, don't tell me, don't, I don't want to sit around spending time telling, learning about things that I'm not good at during my summer, I want to you know, have some time off. Um, and so we kept trying to think of other ways to help those kids feel engaged, for things to feel meaningful uh, to them and, and interesting to them. Um, and so at the time, actually, I was living, uh, you'll appreciate this, uh, I was living with um, a couple of friends of mine who were actors. And seriously. They're the best um, roommates. Yes, yes, they really are. They were great. Always paid always pay the rent on time. Um, and, uh, and we were up one night having a conversation, and I was sort of telling them I was struggling to connect with some of these kids. And I was describing, they said, well, what are you trying to do? And I said, well, you know, it's, it's tough because we're trying to help these kids to be able to um, not just do things that look social, but really connect, right? find ways to understand other people's perspectives, find ways to you know, regulate their responses so that other people will want to continue to talk to them right? rather than, um, than walk away, uh, find ways to um, uh, be engaging and interesting and unexpected um, because that's what teenagers do, right? That's what they want to do. And uh, one of them kind of looked at me and said, well, well that's improv. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And we started talking about it. And we started, started, kind of started, started thinking about it. I had done a little bit of work in improv prior to that. And um, we, I remember staying up you know, late into the night, feverishly writing down activities and, and games and, uh, and things that we could do uh, to, um, to, try, to try to adapt improvisation techniques and principles 
for these kids on the spectrum uh, who are having a tough time. So I went in the next day and I went and talked to my group leader and she was kind enough. Uh, again, I was a young kid in my 20s and I was, uh, uh, she was kind enough to say, sure, yeah, give it a try. And so we tried. And uh, of course, I wasn't taking any data on efficacy or outcomes. I wasn't you know, a scientist at this point. I, was, uh, I just wanted to help these kids and wanted them to, to enjoy some of the time they were spending with me. Um, and uh, we actually put on a little play and, that they wrote. And, you know, people, kids stopped throwing chairs at me. I can't say any other, you know, larger outcome. I'm not going to make, you know, claims that we change their lives. But I can certainly say uh, when we were doing these activities, kids seemed more interested and engaged. And it was, it was really interesting, right? Because what we were doing is giving them the opportunity at least to engage on their terms and engage in the things that were interesting to them. You know, we could, we could set up a scene or we could set up uh, an improv game that was based around what, whatever it was that they wanted to talk about, whatever they thought was, was interesting, rather than me, me saying to them, well, look, today we're talking about going to the cafeteria, and I don't, you know, it doesn't matter if you had a bad time in the cafeteria, that's what we're talking about. So, you know, that seemed to be an inroad. And uh, what happened after that was, was kind of interesting. I started working in, in uh, in-home early intervention. Uh, for some time uh, with kids on the spectrum. And uh, the mother of the young man uh, on the spectrum who I'd worked with uh, for, for since he was two years old, he was a teenager at that time, uh, he, she came to me and she said, you know, he's having a tough time in all the different programs in the Boston area. I was living in Boston at the time. And, uh, and she said, well, what are we going to do about this? And I said, what do you, what do you mean me? I don't know. What, what can I do about this work? And she said, well, you know him. And you did that thing at that camp once. Uh, what if we start a camp? And I said, I don't, I don't know how to start a camp. <laughs> um, and uh, she said, well, why don't you just you know, take that idea and build it out? And I was fortunate. Was, um, I ended up writing a grant. Uh, ended up working with a wonderful, um, brilliant uh, clinician by the name of Karen Levine, who's uh, one of the most well-known, well-respected uh, autism clinicians in the Boston area. Um, and an organization uh, then called the North Shore Arc, now called the Northeast Arc, was kind enough to sponsor us. And we created a program called uh, Spotlight. And Spotlight was essentially this same model, uh, but brought to scale. And I actually hired, no joke, um, the people in the first cohort of staff for Spotlight were special education teachers and actors, just that. Um, and actually more actors than special education teachers. Um, and trained them essentially in this approach of, of uh, you know, how do we adapt the tools that we use to teach people theater uh, to help kids with autism be able to find their way in the world. And we initially recruited uh, all kids who had been who had not had good experiences in the other programs in the Boston area, and they came to us, and again, at least they had a good experience. At the end, they all reported having a good time, nobody got kicked out, um, and uh, everyone said they wanted to come back, and at the end, they made a movie. They, they all made a movie together that they um, wrote, um, they... Uh, they so did the cinematography, some groups directed it, some did starred in it, they did music, and a couple of, of plays, short plays. Uh, and that was fun. And uh, it was actually supposed to be a one-off, but then actually a woman by the name of, of Luann Larson, who was my, my boss at the Northeast Art, came back and said, you know, all nine of these families have uh, come to us and said, um, can we do this year-round? And I said, well, sure, let's give it a try. And so the program started to grow. And we, um, we went from nine kids to 27 kids to 71 kids in the course of about six months. Uh, we were um, embedded in school districts, more than a dozen districts around the Boston area. Um, we uh, were doing after-school programs, summer programs, vacation programs, uh, in, in services and trainings and clinics. Um, <clears throat> and it was kind of running this, this, whole, this whole model. Um, and... Uh, after doing this for a few years, I had what I, I call my, my crisis of science. And uh, the crisis of science uh, was basically this, that, you know, this all felt good and kids seemed to enjoy it. Uh, but the question was, uh, uh, what are we really doing here? Is this really helping more, the things that, you know, that, that we want to affect? Um, is this as helpful for kids ability to social, socially connect, as you say, to supercharge their social skills? Um, is it more effective than a really good after-school program at the YMCA for 20 bucks? 
Because if it's not, kids should spend their time in the YMCA program for 20 bucks. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, but I didn't really know how to measure that, how to, how to address that question. And I thought, you know, also there are some kids, this wasn't, wasn't for everyone, some kids liked it, some kids didn't, but how could we predict that? And how can we use that information to make the program better and to hone in on the things that work the best? And then also, how can we get this information out into the world in a way that is fair, in a way that is not, that, that's accessible, that's right, that's not uh, very expensive to, to families all over the country. Um, and so I actually sort of left the pro program. The program is still, still running right now. It's doing, uh, doing very well up in the Boston area. But I left it for uh, an academic uh, research uh, career, which you know, led me through all the different steps and you know, ultimately to running my lab uh, uh, here at Stony Brook called, uh, you call it, people with Stony Brook call it the Learner Lab. Um, like we call it the Social Competence and Treatment Lab or Skittle. Um, we do not have any sponsorship from Skittle at this point, Skittles, but. Uh, Maybe we'll ask one day. Um, <clears throat> and essentially what we're trying to do here uh, is exactly the thing that uh, I set forth uh, to do when I left Spotlight, which is to try to look at uh, all different kinds of programs, not just you know, theater-based programs, but all different kinds of programs uh, aimed at understanding and, and improving social uh, competence and say, um, do they work? Uh, how do they work? Uh, using what all different kinds of measures we use uh, EEG and other brain-based measures. We look at how kids are doing in school, both socially and uh, and academically. Uh, we look at parents' reports and teachers' reports. We look at how kids do in novel social settings. We we hold pizza parties and give, uh, let kids have these opportunities to try these things out. Um, and then we use that to try to better understand where social challenges are coming from, how kids are understanding the world, and then how to use that to better tailor what we're doing. To the needs of the kids we're trying to help. So that, uh, I don't know if you want me to pause there for a moment. Well, you know, it's all so exciting to me because you're singing my song here. Um, yeah. I absolutely love this. And I, and I love that you've got a place there where not only are you doing the things that you're finding work, but you're checking to make sure that they do work. Because we need to have people like you because the actors will run around and they'll go, well, it, it seems like everybody's happier and more productive. But for you to be able to say, yes, but this is what's working and this is why that it's working helps to get funding for more programs to happen so that we can get to that equitable that, equitable that you're talking about. <laughs> 